everyone, and welcome to today's session on blended finance as a tool for successful investments in fragile and conflict affected states. I'm joining you from IFC in Washington and will be moderating today's session. IFC and development institutions like FMO, who's also joined us here today, are seeking to increase their impact in the places that most investors typically overlook, but the places where jobs and opportunity are most needed. For its part, IFC has committed that by 2030, 15 to 25, if, sorry, 15 to 20 percent of its investments will be in very low income countries and low income countries affected by fragility and conflict. To meet these objectives, we're changing the work, the way we work and introducing new approaches. And this includes putting more staff on the ground in or near these countries, providing more advice to companies on ESG and other business practices, working more closely with the World Bank on helping countries get the business environment right to, to attract sustainable investment and where appropriate, and I use the word appropriate, using blended concessional finance to de-risk high impact investments. So today we're going to look at the use of blended concessional finance from the IDA private sector window to de-risk an investment in Yemen. And we're joined today by Yasmin Mokhtar, Chief Financial Officer of HSA Group, our client in Yemen, Aisha Williams, who's Director of Blended Finance on Corporate Strategy for IFC, Sam Meinbo, who's Director for IDA Mobilization and IBRD Corporate Finance at the World Bank, and David Koker, Manager of Public Investment and Blended Finance from F FMO. After we hear from our panelists, we'll open the discussion. So please enter any questions you may have into the chat. But before we dive into this, the discussion, I thought it might be helpful to explain what we exactly mean when we say blend finance. IFC and other development finance institutions define blended finance as the use of relatively small amounts of concessional donor funds to mitigate specific investment risks. Or to put it more poetically, as Financial Times columnist Jillian Tett explained it, what blended finance essentially does is use a dollop of public money to provide a safety net for the private sector to credit risky projects with social value. The idea is to encourage mainstream private investors to finance projects they would otherwise shun because the risks were unmeasurable, long-term, or too idiosyncratic to hedge. So with that, I'd like to open our conversation with Yasmin Mokhtar. So Yasmin, thanks so much for joining us today from Dubai. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the role HSA Group plays in Yemen, especially in relation to food security, as well as some of the business constraints that your company faces? Yasmin, over to you. Pleasure to be joining you, Rebecca. So uh, HSA is probably the single biggest uh, private uh, manufacturer in uh, Yemen. Uh, it's a conglomerate where uh, we have around 20 uh, plus manufacturing sites. Uh, it's an employer for over 16,000 uh, Yemenis uh, in Yemen. And uh, with all obviously the conflict that's happening uh, has become uh, a major, major contributor to providing uh, the basic necessities and goods uh, to the Yemen consumers. Um, among our portfolio are uh, three sites that produce flour. Uh, we also have a sugar refinery. Uh, there is also a dairy plant. And probably these are um, the single biggest source of food security for uh, Yemeni consumers. Um, we produce more than half uh, of the use uh, of such staples for uh, the Yemen economy. Um, the conflicts in Yemen are endless and the constraints we face uh, are accordingly as much. Uh, of course, we have the constraints that arise due to the conflict with ports shutting down, 
roads being shut down, road blockages, which obviously um, lead to disruptions in our supply chain. Uh, being in Yemen, of course, puts us under a lot of scrutiny where we have to work with extremely high working capital. Um, it's extremely difficult to work with suppliers abroad using the same terms uh, any other country would get. Uh, you also have challenges like power shortages, uh, the lack of governmental infrastructure. So um, they're quite challenging, but uh, I mean, HSA continues with its commitment uh, to the Yemeni consumers. And uh, so far, we've been able to uh, function and operate efficiently despite um, all these challenges. Thanks, Yasmina. Uh, so Aisha, I'm wondering if you, I could turn to you now to ask you a little bit about the financing package that IFC provided to support HSA Group and the role that blended concessional finance played in that package. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks everyone for joining today. Um, as, as Yasmin said, Yemen uh, is, is, Yemenis face some of the highest risk for food insecurity and acute malnutrition in the world. Approximately 80% of the population of Yemen requires humanitarian assistance to survive. Um, one of the things that Yasmin highlighted was the high working capital needs that companies such as uh, HSA face uh, in Yemen. In 2020, uh, IFC and FMO, with support from the IDA private sector window, put together a $75 million financing package to support HSA. The key challenge uh, that this package was, was intended to address is uh, the reliance of, of HSA on rather expensive short-term financing to meet their working capital needs. Reliance on short-term financing limits the amount of inventory that HSA can, can, uh, can accrue, thereby making them vulnerable to supply disruptions. Um, furthermore, short-term financing can be uh, prohibitively expensive with rates going up to 30%. The IFC FMO facility enabled the company to address its ongoing liquidity challenges with long-term permanent working capital. The financing specifically allows HSA to raise raw material inventories to sustainable levels, thereby de-risking production. The IDA private sector window was critical to make this happen. The private sector window or PSW uh, provided a 50% first loss guarantee, transferring a significant amount of the risk therefore from the senior lenders, IFC and FMO, to IDA. The de-risking was particularly necessary in this case because the transaction was structured uh, with a, uh, a local Yemeni security package, as well as in the context of the, the, a great deal of macroeconomic instability that, that, that exists in, in, in Yemen. So the combination of support from, from the DFI community plus the, the private sector window really uh, was critical to make this, this financing package uh, sustainable. It was really a groundbreaking moment. It, it was the first time in a decade that IFC was able to invest in a project in Yemen, uh, thanks in very large part to the support provided by the private sector window. Um, and the private sector window, uh, which I think <laughs> Sam will discuss in, in, in more detail uh, going forward, is the largest um, blended finance facility that, that IFC has access to, which enables us to support projects across a wide variety of, of, of industry sectors in eligible low-income and fragile and conflict-affected markets. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Aisha. Um, so Sam, sort of building on um, Aisha's description of, of how the project was de-risked, maybe you could speak to this from the perspective of Ida PSW, why um, this project and sort of more broadly, how does I, IDA work in helping the IDA PSW help mobilize private capital and what thought process goes into that um, when you're making decisions on the private sector investments that you support through a window? Thank you very much, Rebecca. And to all the panelists, it's a real pleasure for me to join you here. To answer your question, it all boils down to two obvious related facts. 
The first one is that ODA resources on their own are not sufficient at all to fill the huge financing gaps that we see across all of the IDA countries, especially with regard to their aspirations towards the SDGs. The other side of that coin is that the private sector is central to reducing poverty and inequality and achieving these SDGs. That in and of itself is why the PSW exists and it, is, it functions to support companies such as Yasmin has just described and addresses a lot of the constraints that Aisha pointed out quite, quite eloquently. And this is something that IDA has been especially proud of since 2017, when we started deploying concessional blended finance as a way in which we could strategically use public resources to catalyze private sector investments in some of the most challenging markets. Now, we do this by deploying a source of co-investment funding and guarantees to de-risk, select high impact IFC and MEGA projects. Therefore, supporting their investment activities and guarantees outside of their typical risk and financial sustainability uh, acceptance criteria. Both IFC and MEGA are heavily invested in, in FCV environments on their, in their own right. But what the PSW does, and this is where Aisha and I spend a great deal of time on the Blended Finance Committee is looking at projects such as the one that we have, recognizing that our, our instruments without that additional push may not be able to get us to where we're able to support a worthy investment. In this case, as Yasmin pointed out, the security package for the transaction was limited to offshore assets constraining the lender's ability to invest due to uncertainties around the value of the assets, as well as the lender's ability to enforce securities in Yemen. Therefore, in the event of default, the recovery value of such assets is expected to be significantly discounted. But rather than walk away from this transaction, we structured it, as Aisha pointed out, in a way that makes takes advantage of IDA's ability to take some, to provide first loss guarantee products that help mitigate the risk of cash flow disruptions linked to fragility of conflict affected situations. Now the unfunded and concession of first loss guarantee of up to 50% provided by IDA PSW for both IFC and FMO's loans was necessary in this case to de-risk de the transaction to such a level that both would be comfortable uh, proceeding. Needless to say that an important feature of this project was actually the IFC's, the, the PSW's ability to support the IFC's ongoing efforts to crowd in additional sources of finance. In this case, it was FMO, and I'm really delighted that a good friend David is here with us to share his view. But let me leave you with some quick thoughts on why the PSW is really essential to the work that the IFC and, and the bank do jointly in supporting FCV countries. Mobilizing private capital is at the core of what we do and is really one of the key principles for the effective use of blended finance. And I can come back to this later. The window's ability to crowd in financing positions makes sure that much more broadly, even outside FCV context, the World Bank's joint commitments towards private capital mobilization is taking place, not just where we're comfortable, but right at the margins where we are challenged. Importantly for us, this is not just about the financing in and of itself, it's actually about using the PSW to leverage other financial instruments from other institutions and making sure that once we've done a couple of transactions, we will be able to attract additional financing that will support these transactions in similar markets. Since it's an inception, close to 10 billion in total financing for IDA countries has been mobilized. 
with a total of 2.1 billion in PSW support. Now, this figure reaches more than 14 billion when you include the IFC and MEGA support. In Ida 19 alone, as at the end of January 2022, PSW mobilized about 3.8 billion. Now, that's almost 5 billion when you include IFC and MEGA. Importantly, PSW continues to contribute to this agenda under the umbrella of a One World Bank group. Because as we all know, working in some of our challenging markets requires analytical work, financing instruments, advisory services, blended in such a way that we are able to identify and partner with companies such as HSA to, to work in these challenging environments. Thanks, and back to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, and as you say, it's it's not just the financial instrument, it's all the other things that go along with it, the advisory work. And, uh, so on the mobilization angle, uh, David, I, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, so FMO is IOC's third largest syndication partner globally with an active committed exposure of $847 million. Um, so we heard from Sam about Ida PSW's role in mobilizing private capital. Could you perhaps share FMO's experience in participating in this project uh, in Yemen? Yeah, surely, <clears throat> surely, Rebecca, and, and thanks a lot. It's for me also a big honor to be participating in this uh, in this panel. Um, uh, it, this has been a very good experience for FMO, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch Entrepreneurial Development Bank. Uh, not in the least because the decade that Aisha was already referring to, we spent that same decade also in looking for opportunities to invest in Yemen, and we were never able to do it. Uh, it we were kind of caught between what we felt was a political necessity, as you may know, the Netherlands government, which is our largest shareholder, um, and our European partners were very active in, uh, the, in the development of Yemen and in and trying to bring peace and stability to Yemen. We wanted to play a role um, through the private sector, but we're never able to get past our credit assessments. Um, so for, this, uh, for these 10 years, it ba basically came to an end when through the private sector window, we were able to join IFC um, in this in this structure with a B loan of of, of twenty million twenty million dollars, um, and that that actually brought us um, I think uh, three important experiences. One, uh, participating in this investment was an opportunity uh, that got us to know the Yemeni market to do the due diligence, to get, get us to know the Yemeni society, build up a network. Um, so I expect actually that our B loan participation um, is and can be a spark, which will hopefully lead to more follow on investments from FMO that we could possibly also deploy our own blended finance instruments um, uh, to these investments. Um, and possibly also in other sectors than just uh, in food security and agriculture. Uh, a second reason is why this is important is important for me as a heading the blended finance operations of FMO to also show to the shareholders of FMO and to our management and to our partners how this can work in, in markets that are under stress of conflict and instability. Um, uh, and, and how much you can actually scale this, even with a, uh, a, a, a bring in a B loan uh, of FMO from FMO's own balance sheet. So it, it's, it's very important for me to show how the private sector window works also to our, um, uh, to our own shareholder and uh, to our own management. There's a third reason why this is important, which is a bit more topical. It will be important is more how I would say this, um, given uh, current developments uh, in the world and our future efforts to protect food security in MENA, which will be a lot tested in the coming months and years. Um, uh, this experience by supporting HSA, by su supporting such a crucial company uh, in a country like Yemen, uh, will provide us a lesson 
for future operations um, that will be very much needed and will, that will need to come online quite fast in, in other countries in, uh, in MENA. Um, and I think actually that blended finance will play quite a, quite a, a big role um, uh, in those future efforts to, uh, to avoid large food security crisis and effects of la large food security crisis. So all in all, we're very happy with this, uh, with, with, with this participation. Uh, it's definitely a platform for, for war and definitely a platform for future experiences. Thanks, David. So I, I think if I could sum it up, so it gives you the opportunity to participate and test the market. It gives you the opportunity to show that this can work, um, that some of the uh, risk that may be in these markets is more perceived than an actual risk. And then finally, I think uh, we can all see that, that this is going to be needed more than ever. Um, so Yasmin, perhaps if we could go back to you uh, for a minute and, and maybe dive a little bit deeper into the actual project. So could you tell us how the working capital supported by this financing package is making a difference for, for your company, as well as for the Yemeni domestic food market? Sure, Rebecca. Um, the uh, working capital uh, funding was... Uh, critical enabler uh, for us as HSK. Uh, we see it more at times like this when uh, global crises break out, but even without that, given our own challenges inside Yemen, um, and as I mentioned earlier, the extremely high capital uh, requirements, working capital requirements and the difficulty of liquidity makes this a key enabler for us. So, for example, with this uh, working capital funding, we were able to secure inventory um, on ground, which was always a challenge for us because of the financing. There were times when uh, we've had uh, port blockages or road blockages where our plants would be operating on a five to 10 day raw uh, material inventory, which uh, considering we are, uh, the biggest provider of, of necessities in Yemen is a massive risk because it does put us at risk of not being able to produce because we don't have the materials required. Um, another critical thing that was referred to by um, Aisha is also buying efficiently, right? When you're working hand to mouth, it is extremely difficult to benefit from uh, the right times to buy, which obviously then again reflect into better, uh, more efficient cost, which would be passed on to the consumers at more affordable uh, products. So with the liquidity issues uh, we have in Yemen, the working capital funding that we received was really a huge breather for us. Uh, it enabled us to ensure we are able to operate despite uh, our own and global challenges that we're seeing. I mean, um, with all the recent news, it's not a surprise there will be global disruptions expected in the supply chain. Uh, and had we not worked uh, with the IFC at the moment, either on this package, we could have been at a very huge risk had we not uh, stocked up and locked and secured our um, uh, raw materials because we have the funding to do so. So, uh, so I really see it as a critical enabler for the sustainability uh, of providing uh, the key staples to the consumers in Yemen uh, at competitive prices. So, um, uh, looking at what happened, what's happening these days, I'm, I'm all I can say is I'm glad we have the package. Uh, we would have been in a lot of trouble were we not uh, able to uh, have it and stop the way we did. Back to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Yasmin. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a real difference in the everyday lives of people. You know, I mean, this means getting food on the table um, to everyday lives. So maybe, um, you know, Sam, uh, we talked a little bit about um, the role of the Blended Finance Committee. 
Um, and I'm just wondering if if we could explore a bit more sort of um, the relationship between the different parts of the World Bank group and decision making and and how does uh, you know what the IFC is doing dovetail with World Bank country strategies and and what sort of factors into the decision making process? Well, thank you very much for that question, Rebecca. And, and coming after Yasmin has, a, has very modestly described the impact that the company is having on the ground. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the fact that being able to select quality projects like this one is an engaging and elaborate process for good reason. We are blending private resources with public financing. And being able to do it in such a way that we're able to address some of the challenges that other people might see is really important. And we do this in, in sort of stages. And I'd like to highlight two governance uh, arrangements that we have in order to make sure that we're picking deserving projects. And then also highlight two substantive issues that we grapple with using that governance process. So the first one is that the governance process for PSW follows your standard uh, structures that are within the IFC system, but also make sure that when projects are coming to the blended finance committee, the IDA team works with our country directors and country teams to make sure that there is full alignment. Needless to say, when they are differing views, we use those views to strengthen the quality of the overall project. The second equally important aspect of that governance process is meeting strict criteria to make sure that it's eligible projects that get the financing. And one thing that is often overlooked is the large number of PSW proposals that don't make it to get to, to the final stages. I don't say this with pride, I say this with an acknowledgement of the rigor that the process goes through and the diversity of the blended finance committee members across the IEFC, including IDA representation, that will make sure that in selecting the final set of projects, they cover a number of factors, but for, for today's session, let me highlight two substantive issues, which really are at the core of what we try and do. One is to make sure that the, there is a strong economic case for concessionality associated with every one of our, of our projects. And because we are using limited public resources, we're looking for that minimum level of concessionality that will ensure that the level of subsidy does not distort markets and is the minimum required to make sure that the project happens. And that negotiation process benefits from the expertise of IFC investment officers who've been in the field, who know that you know, all of the different markets in more ways than I'll ever know. And on that score alone, the IADPSW also benefits from the fact that we are not constrained by any sector. We can work in different sectors with different exper experts to, make, to reach for that minimum level of concessionality required. And I do believe that in this particular project, this was done. So in the case of Yemen, for example, there were only very limited short-term financing options available, as Yasmin explained, and there were no other local international lenders who were av available at the time to offer the type of long-term financing that was required in Yemen. And you heard from David what other investors would be looking for in working in, in this market. A second key principle on, on the substantive side is this notion that I've already alluded to of not distorting markets. We don't want to go in and subsidize sectors that are fully developed, fully functioning. Yemen clearly uh, in this particular case is not. So with PSW support, IFC and, and FMO are supporting a major staple food player addressing food security challenges uh, in a very difficult environment. And so by building on the expertise of all of the institutions at the table, providing the minimum level of concessionality, the expectation is that not only are we 
able to alleviate the liquidity challenges faced by HFSA foods, but actually that we can demonstrate that in other markets as well, these are transactions that are, are possible. Finally, when you combine the governance features I highlighted, the substantive, issue, the substantive issues around concessionality and, and not distorting market, there is one final principle that I would like to highlight. And that result revolves around the issue of transparency and disclosure of information on PSW supported projects in accordance with both IFC and MEGA's respective policies and complemented by additional information on expected impacts and subsidies utilized. This is something that all institutions involved take quite seriously. We're in this market in order to make sure we're pushing the boundaries of private sector investments but also being able to demonstrate that these transactions can be done in other markets as well. So Rebecca, these are just some of the criteria we, we use in very carefully evaluating which projects to support with PSW support. But with every single transaction, there's always something new that we haven't grappled with before. There's robust debate to make sure that we're serving the countries that we work in, supporting companies like Yasmin's brave enough to go to these difficult markets and attracting other investors such as FMO and others to make sure that we are leveraging the very limited uh, public resources that IDA has uh, in, 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 in the quest to, achieve, to help countries achieve their SDG goals. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Um, so, so Aisha, you know, Sam really touched on on the discretion and the selectivity and, and sometimes the heated debate um, that goes into whether we support these these investments or not. Um, but IDEF PSW is not the only blended finance facility under IFC's implementation. It, it is the largest and it is focused exclusively on the low income and fragile markets. Uh, but there are other facilities that we have. We have the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program private sector window. We have the Global SME Finance Facility. Uh, so maybe if you could just expanding on what Sam was discussing in the blended finance principles, how we apply this discretion more broadly as, as a tool to, to mobilize uh, private investment. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rebecca. And, and, uh, as you put it, debate is good and debate is to be expected. <laughs> debate is to be expected when, when, when discussing blended finance, because honestly, this is a relatively new tool um, that on the part of both private sector actors as well as, as public sector actors. So we're all, we're all trying to get to grips with how to best utilize uh, uh, concessional uh, finance. It, it's interesting. I was last week speaking with a bunch of, of graduate students. And one of them asked me, oh, is, is blended finance just aid? Is it the, is it the same uh, aid by another name? And you, know, you have to take a step back and say, what exactly is blended concessional finance trying to achieve? And specifically, it's when a project, when a highly developmental project is not commercially viable due to high perceived or real risks or high costs, the use of blended finance to fill a temporary gap to help catalyze market activity is when it is best utilized. Temporary is important. Catalyzing ultimately market activity is also important. So the difference between the, the principles that, that Sam mentioned, actually there, there are five of them, is to try and ensure that all of the players all of the participants in blended finance are um, cognizant of and adhere to the ideals of minimum concessionality, what's the minimum amount that is necessary to fill this temporary gap and achieve, and, and two, commercial sustainability. Ultimately, what, you're trying, what we are all trying to achieve is uh, commercially sustainable projects that no longer require blended or, or, or uh, concessional finance. I mean, one of the, 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 the typical examples that are frequently referenced when, when discussing the model that we're trying to replicate with concessional finance is the renewable energy sector. And looking at, for example, the early years 
of, of um, subsidies that were given to support the development of the wind and solar energy sectors. Again, temporary subsidies were provided to these industries to try and eventually help them to be um, com uh, commercially sustainable on their own right. And we've seen that happen. And we're now trying to motivate the same type of, of, uh, of behavior, or same type of result across multiple different industries in multiple different countries. So uh, debate is good, debate takes place. What is critical, I think, for, for all of the practitioners in this area is to recognize the power of this tool. When, in, when used correctly, it can, uh, again, help to create um, and support projects that are highly developmental. When used incorrectly, you run the risk of wasting valuable and scarce public sector resources. And you also run the risks of undermining the very markets that you're trying to, to, to build. So it, it's quite important. A lot of the work that I see and, and the bank it does is trying to, um, trying to convert everyone to the DFI principles, <laughs> convert to all practitioners to the use of the DFI principles so that we're all on the same page about what we're trying to achieve. And so that there's no uh, race to the bottom, <laughs> essentially, in the use of this, of this powerful tool. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Aisha. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, you know, we can't, we can't be throwing money at projects that are not sustainable. Um, these are precious donor resources. So care and caution is, is definitely advised. Um, before I, I turn back to, to Dabi for some final thoughts, I just want to encourage everyone to put their questions into the, to the chat as we will have time for discussion at the end. Um, so, so David, I mentioned that, um, you know, I to PSW is not the only game in town. Um, we have the global SME finance facility, the global agriculture and food security program to, and the prospects partnership, uh, uh, to which, uh, the Netherlands is, is an important donor for all of those facilities. Um, and then. You know, I know FMO through through the European Development Finance Institution Coalition also participated in, in the working group group and the drafting of the blended finance principles that Aisha uh, expounded on. So, any thoughts from uh, your perspective as a bilateral DFI uh, on the principles and on the emerging role of blended finance? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And I, I can only echo uh, what, what Sam and Aisha have said about the rigor that we need to uh, deploy in this very scarce tax, taxpayer money uh, and utilizing it for, um, for truly uh, additional mobilizing purposes. Um, and I would also add to the list of uh, facilities that you just mentioned, uh, the, the, the enormous amount of blended finance that will come online and that is already on, online coming from bilateral donors, um, also th through bilateral DFIs with their own instruments, uh, through uh, institutions like the European Commission, through the C Green Climate Fund. So, so there is a wide array of blended finance facilities and we really need to make sure that the principles that were just mentioned by Aisha and Sam are also adhered to in the deployment of, uh, of those facilities. And FMO is working with all these various uh, donors and, and, and we are sticking to these principles and in that sense also play a, a, a harmonizing role. Um, having said that and having emphasized the importance of rigor, we are also facing now an avalanche of crisis that, um, uh, that cannot be solved without the also the deployment of private finance and therefore that need to be solved um, and uh, where where blended finance plays quite a key role in helping to mobilize private finance in a global response uh, not only to the aftermath of the COVID crisis but also to the probability of a large energy and food crisis uh, uh, associated with the uh, with the with the war in in Ukraine. Um, and I think that um, we, I, we can safely say that the, the, the playtime for blended finance is, is over. 
we 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 need to become even more adult faster probably than we we had expected to be um uh, because we're going to be a core tool in the global crisis response and we cannot lose the rigor that was just described uh, and at the same time we need to make sure that the facilities and the experiences that we've had over the past six years um, are used to help scale up these tools and and that's a that's very much a perspective i think from us as a as a dfi who have a lot of clients also in ukraine but also a lot of clients in mena uh, we see this coming and we see that this uh, is going to be a key tool. Um, but we also hear this from our, from our largest shareholder, the Netherlands government. Um, so I really hope that we are able to, to deploy blended finance, um, in particular um, in, in, in structures such as HSA that are a guardian against instability, um, in structures that need to be supported uh, in the food and the energy sector, because uh, uh, we need to prevent massive credit outflows in these markets, but also uh, because these sectors in particular are key to uh, to stability and human survival, and we need to keep the structures in place in the coming uh, in the coming months and years. Um, so that's my final uh, my final contribution to this, and I really am looking forward to uh, to work a lot more with uh, with IFC. Uh, and I hope that at some point in the future, IFC also takes a B position when, when we are leading um, in, in pioneer sectors. Uh, uh, and and I will, I'm sure I will discuss with Aisha and Sam about uh, where, 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 where those structures can be set up. Thanks a lot. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, so, so a question that's, you know, you brought up COVID response and the need to act quickly and deploy uh, in times of crisis. Uh, so there was an ask to, and maybe this goes to, to Sam and Aisha, or uh, you can decide who takes this, but, but how was IDPSW and blended finance more broadly used in the COVID response? And, and what did we learn from that experience, and and maybe, you know, I know Ida PSW focuses mostly on the what we call the Ida only very low income countries, uh, which is not where we have crisis emerging now. But how could we scale, in in response to crisis? Sam, sh shall I start and, and you join in? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> IFC leads. Okay. <laughs> So uh, the PSW actually played a critical role in ensuring that the crisis response facilities that IFC was developing to support um, clients in the wake of COVID, to ensure that those were accessible by our clients in the most challenging markets. So IFC, on the, um, uh, following the COVID, following the outbreak of the pandemic, created a number of what we called fast track facilities that were explicitly designed to provide, uh, to meet the near term working capital and liquidity and trade financing needs of our clients, which were being disrupted by, by, by COVID. Uh, specifically, the, the PSW was used to ensure that those facilities, uh, that clients in IDA and FCS relevant markets would be able to access those type of facilities. So PSW supported uh, IFC's um, uh, trade finance program. In addition, it has uh, provided significant support to uh, an element of the package that IFC provided to financial institutions to encourage them to continue on lending, even in the midst of the COVID crisis to SMEs and to uh, micro SMEs. This is IFC's um, base of the pyramid program uh, where uh, that, that facilitated that type of short-term lending. And PSW, through the use of, of, of a product that we call, um, again, it's a first law, it's a pooled first loss guarantee, essentially helped to transfer some of the risk that the, uh, that the participating banks would incur uh, by lending to these uh, high, relatively higher risk SMEs and micro, and micro SMEs to transfer that uh, from the, the bank or from IFC to, to, to IDA. So really it was, um, it continues to, to, the PSW continues to play a really critical role in IFC's um, uh, COVID response facilities 
uh, across the across the board. Um, just turning to the issue of of countries that are not eligible for the PSW, this actually is something that um, that has been keeping us awake at night um, uh, quite a lot in view of. Uh, as you said, the challenges that we're now seeing across the world. We are truly blessed to have the PSW and to have had a strong replenishment of the of the PSW. Uh, thanks very much to Sam and our colleagues at, uh, at IDA. Um, but the reality is that uh, there has been a significant increase in fragile situations in middle income countries that are not eligible for PSW funds. And we expect this obviously to continue with the, with the current crisis in Ukraine. Additionally, middle-income countries face challenges um, uh, aside from fragility when it comes to climate transition, which, will, which we all know as well will also require significant amounts of blended financing to, um, to, to support. So we're now in the process actually of trying to figure out how to, uh, how to raise uh, financing for these type of, um, for the clients in these type of countries uh, in a similar way that we've been able to benefit from the flexible financing that's been provided through the PSW. Over to you, Sam. Thank you very much, Aisha. I mean, you've, Aisha's provided a very comprehensive response. I'll just add two points to, to her remarks. One is to put the PSW um, within the context of the World Bank Group's response to COVID as a whole. So whilst we had many different programs, with direct support in, in terms of vaccines and health financing, PSW, as Aisha described, was really about protecting jobs. And for many of these IDA countries, we saw tremendous uh, amount of job losses. A recent estimate is about 250 million. Now, in a lot of these markets, there's huge informal sectors. And so being able to provide livelihoods in the, in, the, in, in the sense of good jobs is as important a part of the COVID response as any other. The second point I'll make is that we're not done with this crisis, that it's still ongoing, and there are more likely than not going to be other pandemics. And so there's been a huge surge of interest in terms of manufacturing in, in either countries. Now, those are the, exactly the type of transactions that we will be looking out for, um, that we will be seeking uh, uh, creativity and ambition in, in terms of how we deal with future crises. And so for us, this is an ongoing journey that we will continue to work, work very closely with the IFC. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, I mean, we're certainly in an era of compounding crisis. I know this has been a theme throughout the Fragility Forum. Um, and we've also talked quite a bit about how we're finding new ways to work with and through humanitarian actors. Um, so I know, Yasmin, one thing we, we didn't touch on it, uh, in your earlier questions was how uh, HSA Group is working with the World Food Program. Uh, so maybe you could tell us a little bit uh, about that. Yes, so uh, HSA is an active partner with the World Food Program in Yemen. We uh, actually produce the flour uh, for them that is uh, uh, distributed to uh, Yemenis. It is done via our many uh, facilities. Uh, we also operate with them on some food baskets across uh, some of the different uh, plants that we have, like with oil uh, and the biscuits, uh, etc. Uh, but we have been a key partner for them uh, in their business um, uh, in Yemen and in helping them provide the necessary aid um, and again staples to. Uh, the Yemeni consumers. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, so we have a, a few questions from the floor that I'll just throw out to whoever would like to take them. Um, so question from Orla, how is the risk priced and how does this translate into return for investors for loan interest rates for benefactors? So maybe Aisha, to you on that one. Sure. Thank you very much uh, for the question. So uh, again, this is a critical element uh, of, 
be of designing and structuring blended finance instruments. And uh, it's one that that IFC with, with IDA has been honing for, for many years, um, uh, but which we still continue to, to, uh, to innovate on. Effectively, uh, when designing minimum concessionality, determining how much, what is the minimum level of subsidy that is required to make the, the project viable, you first then need, you first the first question is what is viability so what is the return that is required by the sponsor and what is the uh, return that would be expected by a market participant a financier uh, if uh, it, under normal circumstances so we look at bar- market benchmarks uh, if they exist to determine what would be that uh, that type of pricing or that type of return that a market participant would expect and then we look at the project and, deter- and, and, and assess how much can that project bear. The difference between the two is the amount of subsidy that is required to, to uh, make the, 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 the project happen. So uh, in, with each project, we, we essentially do that, that, that calculation, uh, looking at what is the, 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 mark, the, the market return that, that would be expected given the risk profile of the transaction versus what is the amount uh, 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 that the project, what is the amount of either pricing or, or um, uh, uh, security that the project would actually um, need, uh, could, could actually bear. And the difference between the two is the subsidy and, and the minimum subsidy that we would then seek to make the project, uh, to make the project viable. I should note that when people think of, of um, concessional blended finance, they often think about, for example, loans that uh, charging a, a, a less than market price on a loan, and that being, for example, the subsidy, or even giving an ex, uh, a grant element, and that being the subsidy. The, the blended finance can be structured in a variety of different ways, and it's specifically intended to address uh, what is the what is the market failure, what is the risk that is preventing the project from being from being implemented. So that may not be, it may not be a question of the project not able to bear a certain interest rate. It may be a question of the project not having sufficient security or a collateral to be able to sustain a market, uh, you know, a, a, a loan by a senior lender. So then we look to, then we, we try and figure out how can we uh, address the lack of, um, uh, the lack of sufficient security. So can the blended tranche, for example, take a secondary charge on, on the assets? So all that is to say that it is not so, that one tool is to provide um, lower interest rates or a direct, uh, direct uh, grant element. But there are many other ways in which you can destructure concessional, um, uh, concessional funds to help the project achieve vi- viability. Thanks, Aisha. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, we're also working with a with a tool, although not under the IDA private sector when new, called performance-based incentives, where we, we can encourage our uh, clients to reach more difficult, more high perceived high risk, com- you know, companies like women-led SMEs. And for anyone who's really interested in digging deep. On, on you know how these transactions are structured, what the level of subsidy is. We actually disclose this on a project by project basis on IFC's website. So for anyone that's interested in exploring, you, you can find more there. Um, another question, uh, and then let's we'll say this is an Aisha or Sam, um, although maybe we addressed it to some extent is, from a development perspective, how does one decide whether to prioritize a grant over blended finance? Is there an opportunity cost for the grant component? So I can give you the short, very short response to that question. Uh, we, we try and stretch our grants as much as we can. Um, there are a number of countries who are highly resource constrained. And whenever we have the opportunity to save those grants for those countries, we will. Um, And this goes to the heart of what PSW does. And when the IFC is working on a transaction in these markets and deciding whether this is suitable for blended finance, um, they have tried their best 
to do without it. And, and I think there's a shared view there that we really should be saving our grants uh, for those that would otherwise not be able to receive financing. So in that regard, we, the default position is the concessional option uh, and, and unless, unless otherwise. Thanks, Sam. Um, let's see, we have another question. How do you amplify localization efforts within blended finance, especially during ongoing conflict? Um, not quite sure. Um, I'm hitting this one right. Perhaps that um, touches on sort of our our collaboration with humanitarian actors. Um, but if anyone wants to take this one, um, I, I'm not uh, I'm not sure if this is what the the the, the individual is referring to. But when we say localization, what resonates with me is that um, uh, a big part of what we've learned coming out of the COVID uh, coming out in the midst of the COVID pandemic is the importance of um, local and regional uh, manufacturing to be a local and regional deployment of, for example, of, of, of health facilities, of vaccines, of, of um, uh, lo uh, promoting local and regional resilience. So it, uh, what we've been, and again, what we've been trying to do it, it, as, as a development community, both IFC, the bank and other actors, has been trying to support what has naturally been occurring, which is a large changes in supply chains globally, and and a greater focus on, particularly for critical uh, for critical goods, um, regional manufacturing, regional um, uh, development of those type of goods. Uh, IFC has a program that is uh, in conjunction with the bank called the Global Health Platform. And essentially, that is the intended purpose of this, to, to help support um, local um, uh, production of vaccines, therapeutics, and local healthcare resilience. Blended Finance, again, has supported projects under that, uh, that, 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 um, that mandate. Um, it's not, I would argue again, it, it's not that necessarily blended finance is needed per se in each of these pro in each of these projects again it's it's more um this is the development aim we're hoping to achieve to the extent that there is a a, a gap in the market that prevents these projects from being financed on a purely commercial basis then we are we are fortunate to have uh, to utilize blended finance tools to support these um to support these type of uh, initiatives Thanks, Aisha. Um, since I don't see any, any more comments from the floor, I, I'd like to take the opportunity to turn this over to Yasmin for some final thoughts. Um, sorry, Yasmin, to put you on the spot, but what would you like to see more of from the development finance institution community, the World Bank group, actors in this space? What are we not doing that we should be doing to, to improve economic security in, in challenging places? Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting because uh, I think as uh, everyone was mentioning, whether David or Aisha or Sam, um, mustering the courage to invest uh, in a country like Yemen is, uh, is not the easiest of decisions for uh, investors uh, or for uh, aid, working with uh, the required collaterals, uh, et cetera. So, um, so I think one key thing, and, and it's, 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 it's a bit of a vicious uh, cycle, so to say, is encouraging more and more uh, partners, you know, to, um, um, that despite the risk, the developmental impact uh, of uh, working um, and participating and contributing in countries like Yemen uh, has a massive, massive uh, implication. Uh, it's always the um, dilemma of uh, can we afford it or not? Is the pricing good or not? Obviously, the risk is super high, which, which doesn't help. Uh, when you put it all together. Uh, but once it works, and I think we've all experienced this uh, in our latest deal, it's extremely, extremely rewarding. 
So, um, so all I would, um, you know, hope for is um, continuing to have an appetite uh, despite the risk uh, that's available uh, in countries like Yemen. And I mean, Yemen is not the only one. Um, but understanding, which I'm sure everybody does, that this really does touch uh, people's lives. Despite the higher the risk, the more the people are in need um, of this type of partnership. So uh, I'm sure for us it won't be the last. Um, and all I can say is um, the risk is there, but the need is much bigger than the risk that's at hand. Thank you so much, Yasmin, for those powerful parting thoughts. Uh, I see our timer has run out, so I hope we still are on screen. Um, and I'd like to extend my thanks to you, David, Sam, and Aisha, for a great discussion today and look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day.